The Barcode Podcast is presented by Titanium CPG Insurance. Titanium protects forward-thinking consumer brands. You can check us out on titaniumcpg.com. So I'm really excited that Lori is here with us today, and we're going to talk about all kinds of fun household brands that you have uh, probably since you were a child known and loved in different ways. And so, Lori, thanks for joining us again. And we are going to, I, I want to just kind of back up. In your early career, you you started off in the in the grocery business in uh, with a, a, a little company called Kraft Foods in, mm-hmm. in Southern California. How did you end up in, in that world in the first place? You know, it was back in the, uh, I'll date myself, the early 90s. So I was in school in San Diego. And uh, at that point in time, there weren't actually a lot of jobs. I don't know if you remember uh, the book Generation X, and it talked about right. the Mc- McJob. Right, right, I do. and that was our yes. biggest fear. And um, so I was looking for anything, anything, and it ended up on campus recruiter. And I thought, sure, I can do this. You know, I get a company car. That sounds good. And Absolutely. An expense account. That sounds good. But I had to move to LA. Oh, but. It ended up being great. Yeah, because San Diego's perfect and all, so you had yeah. to leave that. So that yeah. that was a bummer. So, so you were representing at the store level at what what was then Vons and now is Vons, but is owned by Safeway, mm-hmm. and uh, you're all of Kraft Foods brands, mm-hmm. right? So, which at the time included what 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 kind of brands were you responsible for there? Yeah, so we had um, the way that it was segmented at the time. There were you know, there was the refrigerated pieces and there was the meats. So cheese, and then, obviously. Yeah, yeah. And then the dry grocery. And I was more in the dry grocery end of things. And um, before I was in Vons, I was in, you know, I would serve the little bodegas in Compton and South Central and North Long Beach, all the great, really nice areas of LA. Oh, that's fascinating. LA. Yeah, and uh, and actually store selling, like where you would go in and talk to the store manager, and I had a paper order sheet, and I would write it all down, and then I would bring my paper back and do that. And so what was your pitch? So you would go to these these bodegas in downtown mm-hmm. L.A. or in, in, in some of these kind of transitional neighborhoods and mm-hmm. that sort of thing. You're, uh, again, you're a young woman uh, mm-hmm. kind of cruising down the street in some neighborhoods that ha- are, are made famous in, in many movies for mm-hmm. not being the safest places, right? Yes. So what, what were you doing? Like, what was your pitch? <laughs> Well, um, it it was interesting. I also took a lot of martial arts during that time. Very helpful. That's good. <laughs> um, to be downtown in Compton because it was around that kind of tenuous time. And uh, when I would go in, it was interesting because there really were no reps that were going to these stores. So they were surprised to see me in the first place. And I drive up in my little company issued Taurus. And, um, you know, I would just tell them that I could you know, just by displaying something, you can draw the shopper's attention and you'll make more money. It was pretty basic. You sure. Know, yeah. Because they the just fundamental to the business. Yeah. And um and they needed, you know, they were trying to make money because of all the everything that was going down in downtown LA at the time. Not a lot of people were there that were had very much money to begin with. So, you know, price discounts and things like that, they hadn't seen a lot of that. And so when I would bring it to them, it was pretty basic, like, hey, if you can just mark down this price, we put up a display. A lot of times I got that for free because I was there putting up the display myself. You did it for them. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then they would make their money. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So, yeah. so you're, uh, so you start off in the bodegas and you, mm-hmm. then you kind of graduate to the, to the Vons, which right. is kind of, you know, Vons, like and, Vons and Ralph's were yeah. big time, exactly. big time LA stores. Um, so, so then what, what brands are you representing there? So there I had, um, Maxwell House Coffee, U-Band Coffee, and later we had acquired, um, the license for Starbucks Coffee. So we did that introduction as well. In addition to the post cereals and Nabisco cereals, those were transition time as well, and right. the um, Jello gelatins mm-hmm. and oh, handy snacks puddings. Mm. So, so it was uh, it was the the shelf stable kind of dry yeah. dry goods kind of stuff yeah. there too. Yeah. Okay. So, um, what did you learn like in that that first you know kind of season of your career in in grocery? Like, what mm-hmm. are things that maybe you learned? In that in that way station of your life that might not be obvious today. Mm. Well, I learned the math that the buyers do. You know, I would go in and I would say, "Well, I'm going to have this price. You know, we'll sell it to you for this price, and then we'll take the off invoice, and then we're going to have a coupon 
and that coupon is going to mark down the price. And then we're going to have this other, you know, scan and that's going to mark down the price. And so here's your final price and here's the margin. And the buyer would say, no, that's not how we do price here, ma'am. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. How, so they push back. Yeah, because they didn't include that, right? They're mm-hmm. just, it's the money they put in their pocket. They don't. Yeah, they don't, like, they don't care about them, your financial marketing. voodoo stuff, right? It, yeah, exactly. And so right. I would do all this exactly voodoo, <laughs> you know, this voodoo math to get to a nice price point. And they're like, no, we see you all the time. We don't need that. That's right. And yeah. um, so I learned that really quickly. And I also learned that, um, you know, they just want to be straight to the point. Whereas I would prepare all these, you know, beautiful presentations and they're like, just flip. They would flip to the very back mm-hmm. to the page. What's and, the bottom line? Exactly. What's the bottom line? They didn't really care about my... PowerPoints or anything like that, and you better get to it fast. That's right. Mm-hmm. So, so you so you start off there in in Southern California, and you know for craft, and again, all of these these really, uh, you know, brands that people have known and, and love for a long a long time. And so, but at that point, when you're working with big, well known brands that are supported with print and TV and radio ads mm-hmm. and all the things. Again, that's part of why we know all these brands. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of your focus was really on. Uh, you know, I guess probably promoting those those brands, like doing mm-hmm. off-shelf displays and mm-hmm. making sure that you're, you know, maybe some seasonal stuff like, hey, it's time for Jello salad or whatever exactly. the thing is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was a lot of the focus. Um, I mean, it was kind of, it was a little bit more than that. So it's different in now working at smaller companies. Uh, your folks, you just want to get on the shelf. You want to make sales. There, you're really managing to um, a budget to try and make numbers because, I had numbers to make, but also the retailer did because the way it was set up at that point in time was that retailer would get a kind of a bonus almost from us if we met certain hurdles. So they had that in their interest. And so, um, you know, I'd spend a lot of time making sure that I was going to make my numbers, but it had to look good on their end too. So it was that. And then also, you know, with the seasonal displays and managing to the right, you know, amount of TPRs and the right amount of trade spend and all of those. And those are temporary pieces. price reductions for yeah. those of you keeping score at home. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, that's exactly. right. Yeah. yeah. And then also trying to get, you know, just like anything, I had, you know, X amount of uh, price reductions and, uh, you know, trade spend to get there. And it's never enough, right? And so, in order to reach my numbers, I would need a feature, but I really only have TPR money. And so how do we work together, Mr. Retailer, to figure those things out? Right. Yeah. No, that's good stuff. And so I, I love that, again, part of, I, I think, when you start off in your career and you're you're in that like boots on the ground role and you're in the stores and you're negotiating with the store managers and the department leads and all that kind of stuff, you learn uh, the nuts and bolts of the industry, I think, mm-hmm. from a very unique perspective. So I want to pause there for a second. And uh, before we transition to all the other kind of cool stuff that you've done in your career, obviously we're going to talk about food a bunch. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I I want us to kind of to interject here um, one a a question that I often ask and usually ask uh, our guests is, uh, you know, and again this is this gives us an opportunity to think about and talk about the role of food in your life. Mm -hmm. Um, Tell us for a second about. Um, either your your favorite meal, best meal ever, something mm-hmm. along those lines. I want to I want to hear yours. Mm, so my favorite is um, so I grew up in the Central Valley of California, where most things are grown. Right, and you know the breadbasket of the United States. That exactly right. Back yeah, that's day, exactly right. Yeah. And um, and in a town called Manteca, and um, I was fortunate enough to to live in an area where. Uh, there were a lot of farms, but we weren't farmers, but we had land. And um, my dad uh, uh, was Portuguese, so we had he would they would have this, and the, the, a lot of the community was Portuguese and Hispanic. And um, we would make a dish called sopish. Okay, if you are familiar with that, yeah. and have you ever had that before? I haven't had it, but it's, I've heard of it. It's delicious, but and if it's made well, and um, what's he, so what's in it? So. You know, it's if like, it's Portuguese, I assume it has seafood in it, but maybe it doesn't. It, okay. actually, it's a stew, and so it has beef, right? Okay, and there's wine, and I'm sure in the broth, mm-hmm. and um, you also have you put in uh, carrots and potatoes, so it's it's a Portuguese stew, right? Really, and um, my dad would put a lot of wine. <laughs> I actually have a lot of stories about this. Uh, I mean, it's it's such a bit, and it's one of those meals that. Um, 
it's very much about the culture. And in fact, in the town, they would have um, what they call a festa. Okay. And they would have soapish like it and they would feed the town like you could come in and huge that was, vats of soapish yeah and you would just go and they would just feed the town you ladle it out yeah it was it was really neat um but the reason why i liked it is the flavors so you talk about different types of flavors i remember going out and my job was to get them because i was a little kid was to get the mint and so we would grow mint mm-hmm. on you know the property it grows like a weed and i would go out and i get the mint and i bring that in he would put just a little bit of mint in there and a little basil leaf and um just the the wine combined with the broth of the beef and all those juices kind of going together um was just smelled so delicious and just it's different and there's garlic there's all kinds of different spices i've never personally made it i should but um after you make the stew once it's ready to go like all the meats kind of soft and everything and the meat turns red because of the red wine that you're putting in it right. and all the juices and um you put you cut up french bread and you put the bread on top and that kind of stops up the juice okay and so it's this kind of i'm liking how this is sounding yeah it's almost like a slop but it tastes yeah. so good <laughs> it's like and a so casserole the, and, yeah, yeah it's like the juices and the bread kind of is all mushy and uh-huh. it just soaks into the bread like that and just that I guess the textures and the taste and the smell, it just reminds me of... Just... And eating it communally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. what what drew... Uh, so your family and, and these uh, a lot of uh, Portuguese uh, immigrants to, mm-hmm. to this part of California, mm-hmm. was it agriculture or were there other, other draws there? I think it was the agriculture, yeah. And, um, you know, it was a small town when I lived there. There was 30,000 people. It's much, much bigger now. In fact, they, sometimes people will refer to it as the East Bay. Oh. And there's really no bay. I mean, it's really, really far. You know, <laughs> That's it's, right. It's far from the East Bay. Uh, but yeah, there was a huge agricultural community, a lot of cows, dairy farmers, um, almond orchards, or in Manteca, they call them almonds. Almonds. Yes, because when you hit the tree, you knock the L out. Oh, knock the L out of it. Exactly. That's right. I love it. I love it. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay, so so then fast forward. Thank you for sharing that. That's Mm -hmm. uh, again. It makes me makes me hungry to think about it. The uh, so so you at at some point you transition over to uh, Conagra, Mm -hmm. and you have a whole bunch of other brands. And there at at Conagra, you did both category management and brand management. First of Mm -hmm. all, tell us what's the difference between those two things. well, category management is more uh, – so as a, brand, as a brand manager, you're a brand owner, and you're responsible for stewarding that brand. And, and, and so you're, you're, you're kind of like making sure – you're advocating for your brand inside of this bigger organization, yeah. and you own it. And so it's like, all right, this is my brand. i got to make sure I get the resources over here. Exactly. Mm-hmm. As a category manager, it's different because you're kind of working on behalf of the entire category as a whole. So there's two different types of category managers. At least there were, there's different, you know, they'll call them different names. Every company, every organization is a little bit different. But the way that it was set up there, and I I think it's like this in many companies, is there's corporate category management. So you're part of the brand team. And then there's more like category management as it's associated with sales. So the category management as it's associated with sales is your more um, account specific. So you might, uh, so the brand uh, might say, okay, we want, this is our strategy for the year and we're going to bring in two new items and we're going to take out three and the new shelf set's going to look like this, right? right? The um, All the account people, all the sales people would work with their category manager to determine where on the shelf it's going to go and how to sell this into the retailer because you always want to get the optimal shelf placement. So that was the 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 sales piece of it. As a corporate category manager, you would look at it globally and say, okay, um, before it even gets to sales, like where is the optimal placement? Uh, if we get you know X amount of distribution, what does that look like? What are the, all the different shelf sets? And um, what's the you know the optimal assortment for right. the shelf set as it relates to the entire category? Right. Right. So you know I'd be working with a brand manager and they'd say, well, we want to bring these new items. What are we going to do? Well, you're probably going to want to discontinue, um, you know, ours. You got to look at yourself as well as everybody else. When I rank the category, I'm going to take the bottom, and darn it, we're in it. Right, right. right. And you, it's almost like you have to give up a little to get a more. That's right. And That's when right. you go to the retailers, and I would look at the overall um, 
optimizing to make more money. Because when you go to the retailer with new items, you're going right. to say... You're trying to make it all work. Yeah, the math has to yeah, work out. Yeah, for the same amount of space, That's we're going right. to increase your sales by 20%, and here's how we'll do it. And oh, by the way, I should get two more facings right. because I'm the one that's going to be doing that that's for right. you. That's right. And I think it's good for people to understand that uh, in particular, so a lot of retailers are structured so that they have a leading... Uh, company or brand that serves as a category captain or a category steward that's kind of coming alongside and theoretically, somewhat selflessly, uh, providing a service to help that retailer optimize their assortment in a given set. Mm-hmm. And so when you're, when you're a big company like ConAgra, you have a unique set of opportunities to come alongside those retailers and mm-hmm. suggest, because you have a lot of resources, you have planogramming mm-hmm. teams in-house who can mm-hmm. say, look, this is what your set could look like if you had these extra facings, right? Right, right. And it, it kind of, went, so we were looking at it, so a lot of it was shelving and placement like that, but it was all of it. It was pricing, promotions. It was very much an, it's a very analytical role. Mm-hmm. So you are, you're kind of the voice of reason with the numbers to right. back up whatever it is, the brand strategies you know, what you want to accomplish. So when you go in there, it's, you're showing like, okay, I've looked at your category, especially if you're the category captain, Mm -hmm. you're always going to have your, you know, your your babies in there. Yeah. Yeah. But you have to say like, oh, you know, my baby's ugly on that one. So that's right. Get rid of that baby. But overall you're optimizing or or otherwise you, you lose it. That's right. That's right. So yeah, because then you're no longer the the leader there. That's right. So, so who, what are some of the brands at that point that you're, uh, that you were, stewarding on, on the category management side? Oh, so in category management, so I worked um, with Orville Redenbacher mm-hmm. Popcorn, which is right. hard to say fast. That's right. <laughs> um, uh, Peter Pan Peanut Butter. Oh, also hard to say fast. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that, maybe that's the theme. Yeah. yeah. And then um, what were some of my other brands? Um, oh, Snack Pack Pudding, mm-hmm. Swiss Miss Pudding, and Swiss Miss Cocoa. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, I believe those were the, the big Do you, ones. So, so when you're working, when you're when you're part of a, a big company and you have all these 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 brands, do you have favorites like along the way? Like, do you do you, do you oh, develop yeah. kind of your own, you know, kind of your favorite kid type kind of scenario? You do, and it's usually yeah. the one you like to eat. That's right. right? Yeah. <laughs> just like, no, have you tried this one? It's exactly. So good. Yeah. yeah. I mean. Uh, yeah, I didn't get as many samples as I did when I was in sales. Right. And uh, I can't imagine. I mean, it was great to be out of college and get cereal and jello. I mean, I lived on that for a while. That's right. And, um, <laughs> and oh, macaroni and cheese, like Kraft macaroni and cheese. I had oh, that one too. Yes. I forgot about Blue Box. Uh, that, man, that stuff was good. But coming out of school, <laughs> Again, that in my it, car, I was ready to roll. Absolutely. That's right. It's like upgraded ramen it, right there. Exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. And uh, so, yeah, when I was at ConAgra, the Orville Redenbacher, which I still eat a lot of that to this day. Um, and the refrigerated Swiss Miss pudding was mm. a good one. It's not, you don't really see it as much anymore. It was kind of a smaller right. thing. It was a, a minor thing. So then you mm-hmm. transition from category manager to brand manager right. at ConAgra. And then right. what, so when you did that, what brands were you uh, focused on? Well, it was kind of interesting. Um, so I was, when I had transitioned over I was on the um the snacks team so I had known a lot about that category that's we called it snacking at the time that was the business unit because you had the popcorn and everything and the puddings and um when my first brand manager role was with Knott's Berry Farm jams and preserves and it was like one of the starter brands did you get like a a a free pass to Knott's Berry Farm you know I thought I would but I didn't no unfortunately it wasn't (laughs) yeah I wanted to go to Knott's Scary Farm and all that and it didn't happen that way oh bummer yeah but it was a really interesting experience because um with a lot of the starter brands, they were just smaller in um, their overall revenue. And right. I mean, I think this Which one, made them starter brands. So it's like, yeah. okay, if you mess this one up, it's not gonna, new person, you're not going to devastate the company. It's kind of a rounding error. I'll, um, but what was interesting about this one is because I was in Southern California at ConAgra when it was there at the mm-hmm. time. Uh, that's where the grocery business was. Knott's was there also. And the plant was there. So I was able to go and experience the plant very easily because it was in right. Brea and my you know area was you know my office was nearby. So um, one of the challenges at the time was you know how do you optimize this? And so I could actually go to the plant and watch how they were you know putting you know watch it run through the system and 
look at understand how Making all of the that preserves. operations works. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that was a unique experience, I think. Absolutely. And then, uh, so at that point, uh, ConAgra's grocery business, you said, was located in Southern California. Mm -hmm. uh, since moved to Omaha, is that yeah, right? Everything yeah, everything moved to Omaha. Um, and so, Chicago, yeah. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. all, all, the, all the Midwest things. Right. And um, so, so you start off at Knott's Berry Farm and, mm -hmm. again, kind of cut your teeth there on, on, on this baby brand and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And then uh, did, you, like, you, did you have any other brands that you worked with? Oh, yeah. So after Knott's, I went to um, Rotel. Rotel. Uh, so I went from, you know, kind of a small brand that was f fairly regional. Uh, it was mostly Southern California. And then Rotel, which was, you know, a So if any one. of you ever were, uh, so, so really it kind of mm -hmm. came full. You had Velveeta and, mm -hmm. yeah, and, yeah. and Rotel. Exactly. You know, like all the things. And exactly. like it's all Lori's fault. It, yeah. All, all, the, all the Rotel dip that, that uh, all of America has eaten. Yeah. Well, it was <laughs> she funny because I, I didn't know what queso was at the time. Uh, that wasn't a thing. That's fascinating. Yeah. So, um, so I got to learn all about queso and how did you learn about, how did you learn about queso at that moment? Well, like, with Rotel, cause that's right? like so you put so the spicy Rotel and with the Velveeta that's right. and there were all these recipe pads and I had to make sure like, that I got it up for uh, Super Bowl season and New Year, like every right. holiday was. Were the time you disappointed for Rotel. when you first like heard that you had you were going to get this this canned like tomato stuff or uh -huh. whatever? And you're like, why? Who? If yeah. you didn't know what queso was, then why why would you want to be on the Rotel desk? I know. Well, the Rotel desk was actually really fun because okay. one, you were popular at parties because you had the queso. That's right. But two was that um, they at the time. I believe what's the uh, NAS NASCAR? Right. Um, they there was an affiliation with NASCAR okay. at the time, so it was kind of fun in that it's way. Some celebrity. Yeah, yeah, you got a little bit of uh -huh. you know fun promotions. You had a real ad budget, right. things like that. Again, because Rotel's yeah. very popular in the South, which it, maps yeah. pretty well with uh, with NASCAR. Mm -hmm. That's, it, uh, exactly. Right. Exactly. Okay. So so then, uh, but Rotel people don't buy it. Uh, just in view of getting Rotel, it's it's an ingredient or a component in mm -hmm. something else. And so, mm -hmm. did you find as a brand manager that you had to you were constantly doing collaborations with other people? Mm -hmm. How how did that work? Well, some of it was established and some of it wasn't. Like Rotel, you know, for example, queso as a recipe mm -hmm. was. I had just discovered it, but it had been going on in the you know out in the West for a long time, Southwest. And um, w were you working uh, at Conagra on the Rotel desk the first time you ever had queso? Yes. Okay, so tell tell me about that moment. Like, when did you have, <laughs> like, were, were you just sitting in a cubicle somewhere and they're like, I don't think you understand what's about to happen here. Like, what? <laughs> well, that's it, almost. <laughs> um, so the way that it works when you, it's almost like when you are going through uh, the brands like this, it's like school. It's like you're a class. Like everybody kind of gets promoted around the same time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it sucks when you're held back. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> but oh, everybody's kind of coming up. There. Yeah. So there was, you know, let's say the say if I'm a sophomore at this point, then, mm -hmm. you know, the junior who was on the desk before me, mm -hmm. she uh, she was a friend of mine. And she said, oh, I'm so excited you're going to get Rotel. You just wait, queso. And I'm like, I've heard of this queso. I've never had it, uh -huh. right? And she so when I got the desk she came over and she brought me the crock pot full of queso which she's is like, how it had to come yeah, yeah. she said you are going to be the most popular person at every party <laughs> and she had every variation of it like uh -huh. ooh, and then you can put the spicy ones in there and then you put some meat you know, and it was hilarious yeah so that was that was exciting that, that's and i really, was popular absolutely yeah. that's great almost yeah. as popular as i was when i would make the jello shots when i had the you also know, yeah, <laughs> back if, in yeah the day. if you if you could have had two jobs at once that would have been really powerful <laughs> exactly. um and then, uh, so so again, still at Conagra, uh, you did. You also did Snack Pack too, mm -hmm. right? So what? Mm -hmm. So you transition is that like your junior year? Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, because um, so I was an assistant brand manager, an associate, and then brand manager. Right. right? So you kind of grow up. Um, what's interesting about the way that they would structure things and put you through, kind of put you through the system, uh, or your school, was that you would get exposure to a lot of different things. So when I was on Knots, it was uh, strong brand recognition, smaller brand, but very small regional, right? Um, with opportunities around the P&L and optimizing it with regard to the plant. And we had to make decisions. Do we keep the plant? Do we not keep the plant? How Do we keep the business? Do we not keep the business? So it was small, but 
big decisions absolutely to be made. and then um with rotel it was strong regional brand very strong following um but it it was regional and seasonal uh and so tomatoes which i didn't know this you know even though i grew up in the central valley is you've got that season where you harvest them mm -hmm. and you have to forecast the correctly because right. that's your forecast for the year that's right those are all the tomatoes you're growing. right and if you don't do it right you're kind of messed up right that's for the right. rest of the yeah. year and your in your uh in your your volumes so i learned that um and then being an ingredient so then i mean you also found out that that texas eats a lot of queso exactly <laughs> yes well and the seasonality it was such a s strong seasonal brand and partnerships with other you would maybe think they were competitors, you know, right? right? So I'm calling up Velveeta. And uh -huh. actually, I, I didn't, because I didn't know any different. I had kind of run out of money. Like, uh -huh. I didn't have enough money to do, because it's the end of the year when you're doing these promotions. That's right, yeah. And um, Because you're getting ready for, like, bowl season and all that yeah, stuff, Yeah, right? and uh, your budget, right, uh, you're managing it. And I thought, oh, no, I'm not going to have enough or to do... I, I needed a big enough promotion to be able to make my numbers for the year, which would require X amount of dollars, right? right You're doing the right. math, and I'm like, oh, I'm short. Huh, I wonder if the Rota if the Velveeta person has more money than me. So if we're doing this promotion together, like maybe we can combine our funds. That's right. right? And so I remember like finding, you know, it was back before, you know. Before it was easy yeah, to find Yeah, before people. it was easy. Yeah, you had to call information or yeah, something. Pretty yeah. much. Yeah, I don't remember how I did it, but I ended up getting to the right person. And we end up combining, like co-marketing right. this thing, even though it wasn't like co-marketing wasn't a thing, but we just did it on our own, brand manager to brand manager. Yeah. And, um, That's super resourceful. Yeah. And it saved both of our <laughs> Your situations. Budgets and yeah, situations. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so then when I got onto the larger brand, you know, so, you know, I learned all that. And then you get into something like Snack Pack, um, which was all about... Um, you know, we were trying to do commercials, but it had been very commoditized, and there weren't very many competitors in that market. It was like Snack Pack and Handy Snacks, which I knew from That's previous. That's right. And, it's, and, and this is the, these are the go-to puddings for kids' mm -hmm. lunches. Mm -hmm. That's really mm -hmm. kind of the market for yeah. that stuff, and right? shelf-stable pudding, right? Right. 99 yeah. cents type That's of, right. you know, really, you know, BOGOs. I learned a lot about uh -huh. BOGOs. Right. Mm -hmm. Buy one, get one free. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you did that for a while, and then at some point, you made uh, you made a big career transition over to. Uh, at the time, was it uh, was it Orange Glow or what? What, what, what was oh, it? Yes. What was this next moment for you? Because this is a big shift. Yeah, it was a big shift because I'd spent so much time in big CPG. You know, you're just a little piece of a way big situation, and um, I'd been there for many years. And I just wanted something smaller that I would have more of an impact mm -hmm. on. And um, and also, I was, you know, going to get married and wanted to buy a house. And I don't know if you know the real estate in Southern California, it's, especially in Orange County, right? Yeah, a little difficult to A little afford. expensive. And so it was just time for a change. Yeah. And um, ended up coming across this opportunity in Denver, Colorado, with this little company called Orange Glow. And they're, I guess... 95% of the company was this other brand called OxyClean. OxyClean. Yes. And so I went over there to be uh, to work on the OxyClean business. Okay. So now this is a really interesting story because mm -hmm. so, so you, you moved to Denver mm -hmm. and uh, you don't really know what you've signed up for at this point. Mm -mm. You just know you're doing something different. Mm -hmm. And what did you walk into with the OxyClean brand? Oh, wow. This was, <laughs> it was very <laughs> funny. Um, so I'd never, I'd only worked in big companies that everything's already there for you, right? And mm -hmm. someone has done it 10 times over. There's a system, there's a piece that does, you know, you always have somebody to go to. That there's already it. a spreadsheet for yeah. that. Yeah, and there's like a is. list of a process or something, right? I go into Orange Glow and uh, work on an OxyClean business and it's a family-run business, which in and of itself is different, right? Because right? you just can kind of do in some ways whatever you want. Yeah. And um, I remember my first... So maybe second week there because I'm trying to understand the brand, right? I said, "Oh, where's the PNL? You know, I'm the brand, like you know, I'm the brand manager. Um, I need to see the PNL for the business." And they're like, "What's that? What do those letters stand for?" Yeah, I, yeah, the profit <laughs> and loss lo statement. And they're like, "No, we don't have." Okay, let me see, ask another way, you yeah, know. And right. 
ended up, it just wasn't set up. Do we make any money? Yeah. That might be another way to put it. Yeah. 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 I was like, you know, uh-huh. the one where it starts with the sales yeah. and it ends with the profit? <laughs> that one. I want to see that one. Yeah. And um, so there was that. And then I remember when I did finally get the numbers, uh, I was used to seeing things in millions. Right. right? You round yeah. it to the millions. Mm-hmm. And I said, oh, okay. And it was a big business, but they didn't round in the million. You know, uh-huh. it was, yeah. it wasn't rounded. <laughs> <laughs> There's no, no little, uh, yeah, add, add yeah. three zeros to everything you see. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. And just, you know, it was so different in the way that things were structured. Um, I mean, it was great because you just had so much more freedom right. to do things, you know. How many people worked there at the time? Oh, gosh. I'm not sure. I mean... Well over a hundred. Okay, so yeah. it wasn't, it wasn't it, like it, it wasn't tiny. like there weren't like five people there. No, right? so, no, no. It was a pretty because Walmart was a huge business at that right. point for them, and um, it was. I mean, it's powder in a box. The margins were incredible. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Was, were they uh, were they doing the TV ads at that point? Yes. So so give us some context around that. Like, <laughs> ha, how did that take off? Uh, that was hilarious, actually. Um, so I'd come from Snack Pack where. We had uh, made some commercials and mm-hmm. you know, the production team and your pre-pro and the you know, all those, you know, the actors. There's a and, plan. Yeah, there's a plan. You have somebody write the script. You do all these things, right? So then I go to Orange Glow and they're like, okay, we're going to, you know, we need to reshoot the commercials. Okay, great. Uh, well, where is the, what are we going to do? No, we're going to go out to New Jersey and we're going to meet Billy. It was Billy Mays at the time, the, you know, late night. And it was direct response when you still called an 800 number. Right, yeah. And um, we're going to go out there and we'll just, we'll take care of the script on the way. I'm like, okay, who's going to take care of the script? No, we, we're going to take yeah, it. We're going to do that. Wait, like me? I'm going to, uh-huh. right? okay, let's uh-huh. do this. And um, and we show up at, they had a, um, I mean, there was a real cameraman and all those things, right. but it was at a house and here comes Billy and he's got our script that we wrote in the car. <laughs> And so Billy, how how was he affiliated with them? They just found him? Yeah. Well, the way that Orange Glow came about was, um, in you know, it's interesting because, you know, we talk about all of these, uh, the startups and how you go to the farmer's markets and the trade shows and stuff. Yeah. And that's how they had started is um, the Apple family was at like a home and garden show and they had their product and next to that, so they had this um, product that would make the wood floors the orange Shine. glow stuff. Yeah, the orange glow stuff. And um, next to them was Billy Mays, and he was, you know, pitching some other product, and he was a pitch man, and he was really, in fact, I think there was like a reality show around it right? Um, called Pitch Man, and he was so good at it that they actually asked him to come on board because they had this other product that was the, ox- ended up being the OxyClean product. And so he was so good at pitching that that mm. part of the business just took off. Took off, and it was direct response. And so, you know, at the time, and I guess there's, you know, through the internet now, kind of a similar deal but at the time you know direct response was like you called the 800 number and it was it was a weird thing where mm-hmm. people didn't you know again like you're this is a little bit uh, obviously it o- overlaps with the qvc mm-hmm. things but but it was this uh, it, it's hard to describe but it, it was super low prestige mm-hmm. right so this is like typically late night or off you know, off peak broadcast exactly. times and stuff like that. And you're like, oh, whatever. But the, but, but like the secret is it worked yes. really well, right? And so you guys sold a lot of OxyClean. It was incredible. <laughs> like almost like in spite of ourselves, like it was yeah. incredible. And, you know, he, and he had his pitch down and uh-huh. that enthusiasm and the way he could like convey that through the camera. I mean, he became a, they, ha- he they made famous. bobbleheads off of That's it. That's right. right, super famous. Super yeah. famous. And, you know, anybody who was ever in college knows, you know, That's during right. that time because you're up late. And it would, was crazy because I could liter- I could watch. And it was great because you would know he's on air right now and we're getting phone calls. That's right. And, and do I have a deal for you? We'll get two exactly. if you call right now. Exactly. Yeah. It was crazy. It was almost like your Amazon stuff now. Absolutely. And um, what was also neat about it, and I didn't realize this at the time until I was looking at the budgets, is doing that type of TV was so much cheaper. The Why it ran late night and why, because you're not, your product isn't 
you, you don't have a lot of money. You were buying to in bulk it. too, right? Mm-hmm. You're buying like low, like stuff they were, they had nothing else to put there. So you're getting the best rates. It's exactly. Like, it's like you're getting the cheapest real estate uh, and you're buying a lot of it and that sort of thing. And then That's exactly it. people are bored and they're, mm-hmm. you know, a, again, it's either, you know, uh, insomniacs and, you know, mm-hmm. drunk college students or who, whatever mm-hmm. it is. And they're like, oh, let's call. Right, uh, right. right. And then because the product was great, Right. They, it became a huge following where people just were so, so loyal to it because it really, you know, as a brand person, right, you would dig into the emotional connection. And it was really this powder in a box, right, this cleaning product. Um, they, because we educated them too through those commercials, uh-huh. it would save the day. Like I would get letters, handwritten letters. Oh, it saved my wedding dress. Uh-huh. I was able to restore this thing that I thought I'd lost forever. And I spilled red wine all over the carpet. All over yeah. the carpet, right? Exactly. And so there was this following along with all of that. And so it was just, it was an interesting dynamic because you had this big personality of Billy, and you had these housewives. You know, that was, it saved my day, and this. <laughs> How it all came together was, and it, was it was like it was the magic. Super, yeah, it yeah. really was. Absolutely, really was. that that's really that's really amazing. So, mm-hmm. so you stayed there for a while, mm-hmm. and then when did you move to? When and how did you move to Pete's? Well, I ended up. Um, so I was there, and it was a really successful business. And Walmart, you know, was a huge chunk of our business. It was growing like crazy. Um, but we could, we realized um, that Church and Dwight. You know, was wanting to come in and acquire the business. Which owned Arm and Hammer and a lot exactly. of other household brands. Exactly. I mean, it was a great fit for them. And so, um, about midway through my time, because I was there just over a year. Okay. And um, midway through, we were now like, okay, we're going to get everything ready for Church and Dwight. And uh, I had to make the decision to either go to Princeton, New Jersey, or go back to California. And um, I'm from California. And right. Denver was huge, just like Austin. That's a big was, step. That was yeah. a big step. So uh-huh. Princeton was really not going to happen. Right. Um, and uh, so I started looking for another opportunity, and that's when Pete's came along. Let's take a really short break now, and we'll be right back. The Barcode Podcast is produced by Barcode Media, where our purpose is to equip emerging consumer brands. Go to barcodestartup.com to learn more about what we do. While you're there, you can also read full transcripts of podcast episodes, as well as get additional tools to help you grow your consumer packaged goods business. Now back to the episode. So then, uh, so so you you joined Pete's, and now Pete's is a like Bay Area mm-hmm. company. So so then that was certainly a draw to be back in yeah. back in California. Maybe not the I, I guess maybe even closer, arguably, mm-hmm. to where you grew up than mm-hmm. uh, than Southern California. Then so when you first joined Pete's, what was your what was your role there? Um, so it was kind of it was still brand manager, but it right. was more of the way it was structured was different because. Because you know, Pete's had been around for a long time, right? Yeah. They, they'd been around, had had the coffee shops, mm-hmm. but then they were looking to do grocery, right? right. They wanted to uh, expand their grocery presence. Mm-hmm. And um, that was, you know, because Pete's was the brand of the company, you weren't really, you were more of a marketing manager. Um, mm-hmm. But my job was to go in and develop the strategy to take it from, you know, eight distribution points into like you know the 30s and 40s right absolutely mm-hmm. so so then uh so at that point what, what years is this um so this is probably 10 10 years ago okay 10, years so ago. uh so so pizzas uh again they've kind of had these these outposts they had i know that they were obviously all around the the bay area they mm-hmm. had some in massachusetts and, mm-hmm. and some other places again selective maybe chicago yeah uh, really of, just kind of where you would find a foodie is right. where you would find pete's right so then uh how did you translate the you know the sights sounds smells of the coffee shop mm-hmm. over to that brand as you as you tried to roll that out mm-hmm. In, in grocery stores? You know, it was actually really difficult because we had such a strong retail presence and such a strong brand presence and awareness in California and pretty much anywhere we were. Mm-hmm. If you were a foodie, you kind of knew about Pete's. It was before you had 
a ton of brands like you do today. Right. And, and um, Pete's was the beneficiary of somewhat of a kind of Starbucks backlash at that point. Again, mm-hmm. they they were still at that time independent. Uh, mm-hmm. And and so it was kind of like, oh, if you felt like Starbucks was too corporate. It was the anti. It was the anti-Starbucks yeah, a little yeah, bit. So yeah. you had that kind of in your favor. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was all about the bean and mm-hmm. being true to the coffee and versus Starbucks was more image. Right. right? Mm-hmm. And um, and so translating that it was so the the grocery presence was really an extension of the retail presence I mean retail as it is brick and mortar building where you go your coffee so right. i can now get my coffee and make it at home because i can i'm already familiar with pete's so going into these markets where they weren't familiar with pete's is, was really like a startup because you're going to these buyers they don't they've never heard of pete's that's right whereas in yeah. In San Francisco, it was like yeah. a, I was a celebrity. Whenever oh, I'm I would sure. say, yeah. I work at Pete's, oh, I love Pete's. Yeah, that was we're always a huge deal in San Francisco. And you're like, yeah, but this is Atlanta. Yeah, they're like, mm. and even Texas. I remember right. <laughs> when uh, the sales team came down to try and sell HEB. Mm-hmm. And the text message I got was, you got to know when to hold them. <laughs> you know, because it just wasn't ready for that yet. Yeah. You know, they weren't ready. And so translating it was difficult because you, we didn't have, I didn't have an advertising budget. And it's it's not the kind of brand that you would do that with anyway. Right. Right. It really was so organically grown that we would try to translate it with, uh, we were fortunate enough to have a DSD network. Mm-hmm. So we could uh, really manage in the store. And so it was really at the shelf was yeah. where we would translate it. Yeah. It was like one-to-one at the shelf through our uh, displays and, and through the And you guys partnered with a national DSD network, or did you you did it regionally? We did or, it regionally. Okay. Um, so You didn't operate your own DSD we network. We had our own DSD. You had your own DSD network. Yes. That's a huge deal. Yeah, and so when we went to other markets, we would maybe you know contract with one that was local, mm-hmm. Um, and then we'd have to decide, you know, are we going to have contractors do this or are we going to have them as employees? Because we kind of had both right, yeah. going on. But we wanted to own it all the way through to the consumer. That's a really big commitment. So you guys mm-hmm. had, I'm sure that was a big strategic discussion where, mm-hmm. you know, again, for those of you who are listening, this is direct to store distribution. So mm-hmm. imagine if you said, again, you're Pete's and you you have no presence in Texas, but you're, you're going to enter into Texas. Now you're going to have somebody on your team delivering to every single grocery store right. in, or again, often more than just grocery stores on a weekly, daily basis, mm-hmm. maybe two or three times a week, whatever the mm-hmm. schedule is. And that's a tremendous like investment of, of people and time and money and that sort of thing. How did you guys make the decision to do that? Well, um, it, it just was always that way. I think that when... They Is that just, how it had been in San Francisco? It was, yeah. Okay. There were the Pete's trucks. Right. And um, they were branded Pete's and people, oh, the Pete's... Is coming up in the back, and um, they wore their Pete's shirts, and it was like having, it was more you know, more than a merchandiser because they were branded and they were right. stewards of the brand all the way to the shelf, and they believed in the brand just as much as we did. And um, Pete's coffee is one of the the things about it that differentiates it is that it's one, it's so premium, but also it's very fresh. Right. So. Starbucks can be on the shelf for a year. Pete's would never stay on the shelf that long. I mean, mm-hmm. even in a store, it would be there only like a couple of days. Mm-hmm. So the shelf, the grocery store shelf, the same thing. So those, in order for us to control that Having quality, rapid turns and having yes. kind of producing it just in time for when it's going to be consumed, mm-hmm. you needed to have, you, you couldn't have, have a, in the store. again, kind of your your bigger distributor who's, you know, they're just backing an 18-wheeler mm-hmm. up to the store. Like they don't they don't ever touch it, no, right? No. And so you can't. It's harder to execute at the at the store at the shelf level without that that yeah. personal touch. Yeah, and it actually was how we ended up getting distribution because um, remember I told you about the voodoo math, right, right? Right. I would use that as voodoo math, but it was a real thing because you know when a. Um, so we're all familiar with slotting, right? Right. So I would yeah, go in. like you're, pay, you're paying extra monies, and they could it could look like any number of things, but mm-hmm. these are effectively fees that get you onto the shelf. Right. Yeah. And you know it's you know you almost feel like you're held hostage sometimes mm-hmm. with that. Like I can't. Kind of, what do you mean I have to pay? And the the warehousing fees and all these transportation mm-hmm. fees, fee 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 fee. And I was able to not have to do that because. 
I would say, well, you're going to get more value because you would normally have to have a staff to turn this at the shelf. You would have to have staff to merchandise it and set up the displays and turn the shelf stock and all that. Well, we're going to have somebody in there and that's worth money. That's right. right? And so we would put that in there as part of the margin is that I'm saving you on labor costs. Right. And um, the other piece of it that was great being at the shelf so regularly is you get a facing here, you get a facing there, right? And they're branded, you know, they would wear their peach mm-hmm. shirts, right? And they love the coffee. Like nobody is going to work for the brand if they didn't love it and feel right, passionate right. about it. So they would hand out coupons. They would talk to people at the shelf and they would give me feedback Oh, that's all tremendously the valuable. You know, yeah. when we go into a new market, I'd say, okay, can you ask them, you know, keep this in mind. And it was like having you know, 20 people in the store all the time. Yeah, and people really underestimate the the power and impact of that because it, mm-hmm. it really is transformative. If you're if you're winning and you have people who are, they're building authentic relationships at the store level mm-hmm. and they know the department managers and yep. the stockers and that sort of thing, and then those people are, they're helping them do store resets or, mm-hmm. you know, shelf resets. And then, and, and then they come along and they say, hey, I've got an extra secondary display exactly. that I don't have anything going on with. Do you want it? Mm-hmm. And maybe you didn't even pay for it or you didn't mm-hmm. pay full price mm-hmm. for it. And so opportunities come your way out of those relationships that, Absolutely. that you get from having been in the store. Yeah. So we would have multiple placements throughout the store. Mm-hmm. There'd be, and there were permanent racks. Right. So a permanent rack in the bakery aisle, a permanent rack on this end, a permanent rack. Uh, so the holiday blend would come out. Mm-hmm. Per, you know that would be out there too, and which increases your, your impressions and brand awareness and all Absolutely. the things, right? You're trying to take off in right. a new market. That's essential. Right. And I didn't. We didn't pay for those. Yeah. You yeah. know. But that was something I had learned. You like paid back, for it by investing in the people. Well, yeah, who in, in the, the network. Yeah. yeah. But it right. kind of it paid off. Right. right? Mm-hmm. And that was something I had learned by being in the stores myself back in the day in Compton, right? Yeah. And, you know, if you're there, nobody else is there. Well, then I was the one that made all the sales and they couldn't believe how much I got out of that area. And I said, well, no, nobody had been there for years, right? That's right. That's right. You know, and they're not used to store managers these days aren't used to people coming in and merchandising like that. I know. Right? Unless you're like the Coke or Pepsi person or the chips person or mm-hmm. whatever. And they're just turn and burn, right? You got a big truck. You got to make right. your move. Um, but they chat with them. They'd have coffee with them. I mean, it's yeah. a big deal. Yeah. Having those relationships matters Huge a tremendous amount. Mm-hmm. So it, when you're at Pete's, you guys also uh, did some flavored uh, coffees with, with mm-hmm. Godiva too. What, what was mm-hmm. that relationship like? Mm-hmm. Um, well, that was interesting because... Um, well, first, it was we had to keep it on the down low for a while because uh, Pete's is Pete's, right? Flavor coffee, no way, right? Pure, yeah. 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 You know, you're spraying things on the beans, and, right? Uh, because that's what it was before. Um, Even it, though Godiva is super premium and has has yeah, a favorable reputation, yeah, yeah, but it's still like the thought of flavor coffee, right? right. Because before, flavor coffee was really horrible coffee beans. And you put the flavor on top. Masking. Masking yeah, it because right. you know they're going to add cream or right. whatever to it. And pizza is more like Major Dickinson's blend. And like exactly. Like good, very premium with the yeah. beautiful, you know, greasy, you know, beans uh, with the oils on them. And so what it ended up being was we compromised. So the people that like um, like Doug Welsh, he was, you know, in charge of coffee. Yeah. And um, we said, okay, we there's an opportunity but we'll only do it the way that Pete's would do it. We have to be true to our core values as a company and what the product we put out. So it was still the best coffee beans, right? Um, but And with the highest quality premium flavors, which Godiva represents and also provided, right. so that we could carve out this segment that was really underserved um, and didn't exist. And what was that segment that was underserved? The premium flavored. It okay. didn't exist, right? right? And so you would, you know, at the time, the shelf was just gross, like blueberry coffee or something, you know, mm, something yeah. disgusting. And it was like on the bottom shelf, really dusty. Uh-huh. And um, we, you know, if you think about pricing, the good, better, best, mm-hmm. um, there was good and better, but there was no best for that segment. Right. And so we're, we just, you know, I would go to the buyers and I'd say, okay, now I have a portfolio and Pete's is going to serve your super premium. And you have a gap here with your best version of this other segment that really serves women and yeah, that's what you I was going to ask profile. you. It feels like that Godiva is like a super kind of indulgent, 
female leaning, like it would really uh, appeal to that segment. I'm sure that was very appealing to the retailers. Definitely, as well. because that was in a the, that segment wasn't being served, but that's who was drinking those coffees. Yeah, right? absolutely. And so, uh, so I could just show them like we can increase your dollar ring by you know, yeah. And let me let me open this. a bag of this of this mm-hmm. coffee. You smell it and you tell me yeah. if people aren't going to buy this. Right, it's not all dried out. Let That's me right. now. Let me add some creamer to it, and now mm-hmm. it even is better. So yeah, um, and it was indulgent flavors with indulgent packaging. You know the dripping caramel. You know so all was, of those things. Yes. Yeah. It was, it now was that, really fun actually to work on. No, that's so awesome. Tasty. That's awesome. So, mm-hmm. so you uh, again, your your career has kind of gone through there. You then uh, you moved to Austin uh, mm-hmm. after that, right? And mm-hmm. and and worked at Casasa. Tell us what what mm-hmm. what what was that? That was kind of your first non uh, CPG thing. Yeah, uh, and I, you know it's yeah. interesting in hindsight. I, at the time, I thought. This is so different. I don't know if I can do this, but the re- the woman that um, that recruited me out to Austin, uh, I had worked with her at Pete's. Okay. And she said, uh, I remember when she called me and she said, you know, I really want you to come out here. We're gonna do this brand. Uh, at the time, the company was called Bankview. We want to launch this brand called Casasa in the banking area. And I said, I don't know anything about banking. I mean, I don't even really like. I don't even balance my checkbook. Like, this is not a good, like, I'm not a finance person. And she says, no, 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 no. I need somebody who knows how to sell marketing and knows how to do launch a brand and right. build a brand. And I thought, oh, okay, well, I can do that. Yeah. And um, really what it came down to was we were taking the concept of what is totally familiar to us of a branded product in a retail environment, bringing that to banking, mm-hmm. you know, so that you could have... Uh, distribution points, would be, which would be the community banks and credit unions, right. a branded product that they would share. So if we promote one brand, Casasa, mm-hmm. it would like the dollars could scale for everyone, right? Because right? these right. community banks and credit unions wouldn't have, they don't have the marketing budgets like a Bank of America or a right. Wells Fargo, right? But they're national, you know, and you wherever you go, you can hear about it. We wanted to bring that to them and be able to provide them with that. Well, that and that's a really uh, great insight that you you recognized, even though um, totally different sector, different kind of you know product. You saw that you saw the parallels between what, what you'd been doing your whole career and how that translated over. And you're like, okay, so as the analogy is, uh, as the you know the bank is to the grocery store, as uh, you know as Casasa is to the mm-hmm. to the brand, yeah, right? And, yeah. and that there's an opportunity to do this for folks who, uh, and again, you might not need that if you're Bank of America because mm-hmm. you're you're branded everywhere, you know, and that's yeah, sort of people thing. know, yeah, right. So, what it, were, were there any other things from your uh, from your CPG days that you found uh, translated in surprising ways uh, in in your financial services mm-hmm. uh, station? A lot of things, actually. Um, one of the things that I realized. Um, was that B two B and B two C? You're still talking to a human, yeah. right? Um, and so I did both when I was at Casasa. But what was interesting was on the B two B. And for our listeners, like, oh. describe what Casasa actually was. Oh, so Casasa yeah. is a um, branded checking account. It's right. a rewards checking account where you um, it's a it's only available at community banks and credit unions. And basically, it was we were we wanted to empower the consumer. Because uh, when it we first came out, it was, you know, it was when Bank of America and Wells Fargo they were charging all those fees just to keep your money there, mm-hmm. and we just felt that was wrong. Right. And you should be the bank should be be excited that you're bringing the money to them, right? right? You shouldn't That's have to how pay. It works. Yeah. You shouldn't. I shouldn't have to pay you to hold my money for me. That's right. right? And um, and so the way that we worked it out is that your money would work for you. So you didn't have to be a millionaire to make money off of your checking account. There's no minimum balance. You could use any ATM anywhere mm-hmm. and get refunded for it. You could get a high interest rate for mm-hmm. your money. It doesn't matter if it was $10 or $10 million. Yeah. And um, and so that's what it was. And so we branded it so people would know about it because it had a different name everywhere it was right. held with a uh, And you even had a community. campaign. It was like, do you Casasa? Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And it was this kind of uh, similar to a got milk. Right. right. So it would call Casasa, I don't know. Do I Casasa? That's an interesting name. Let me check it out. And it took a while, but um, but it really did get traction mm-hmm. um, and convincing the bankers right to to take that leap with us was a big deal because there's so much around that. It was almost like when you're going in as an entrepreneur and saying, "Okay, I want you to take this brand, but we're not proven." No, 
<laughs> right? right. Like I how, don't take risks. Yeah, I'm not going to do a that. Banker. Right? Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. I mean, even I don't even know if there's anybody more risk averse, right? Correct. Yeah. And that's a good reason, right? Because sure. that's what you want. That's what you don't, they want, do. you don't yeah. want them to be risky with your money. Um, but they've been there for forever, years, you know, mm-hmm. their family, my granddaddy and my granddaddy's granddaddy. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so there was that emotional hurdle, right? Mm-hmm. Then also, you know, nobody wants to be take a risk and then fail, right? Because right? then I'm going to look stupid. That's right. You know, That's and right. so really kind of understanding both dynamics of I'm talking to you as a business person, and I can tell you the retail concept, like okay, it's just like a grocery store, and you have the brand, and people mm-hmm. don't get confused, and they're going to love it. And we, I have data that will show you, but then to get over the emotional hurdle of taking a risk, Mm -hmm. right. was something that's unproven. So a lot of the work with branding that I had learned before with launching brands or, you know, expanding. Even even back to the early days where you're going into the store, the store managers, right? Exactly. And just talking to them like real people, Yeah, you know, um, it made a huge difference. Absolutely. You know, and then we have what happened. Took their guard down. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because they're they're like you're from where and you want to do what, right? No, you know, you want to put your logo up in my bank. Yeah, my but I my you know red carpet checking is great. That's right, and it, it is great, but sure. only this many people know about it. Like ten people know when we right. can help you have ten million people know. Right, you know, and then they'll hear about it everywhere, and so then they'll come here. People are people, regardless of the industry, regardless of the yeah. station and life and level of the company, and that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, and they're always selling. Absolutely. No matter yeah. what it is. You know? So, so uh, for the for the last uh, several months, I believe, like you're uh, you've been focused on uh, trying to help uh, launch a, uh, a a new to the U.S. brand uh, mm-hmm. in that, that works in the coffee space. Tell us about mm-hmm. uh, about Republica. Oh yeah, so Republica. Um, so Jacqueline uh, is the founder of Republica, mm-hmm. and she's Australian, and she built up this really strong brand in Australia. It's the number one organic fair trade coffee brand on grocery store shelves in Australia, mm-hmm. and it's been around there for 12 years. And um, I met her back at the beginning of the year, and her dream has been to come to the United States and launch the brand here. Right. And, um, you know, you would think at first, like, oh, who needs another coffee brand, right? right? And what's really differentiating. But what struck me about it was that one, the whole she designed the company with ethics in mind. Like the whole company is like that. So it's it's a B corporation. Mm-hmm. Everything's sustainable. The supply chain. You know, they were doing fair trade and organic before it was invoked cool. to do it, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, she, and she built the whole business around it. So. It wasn't like she added a skew and then had to take this cut and had to cut somewhere else to to do it because that's what consumers wanted. She just that's what she believed. Right. And that's a big difference, I think, when you go to a company like I was at, you know, say ConAgra, and mm-hmm. I remember we did a no sugar added pudding, mm-hmm. right? Because that's what consumers wanted. That's right. That's right? what the data told you. Right. It wasn't like ConAgra stood for no. We really want to reduce obesity in children. That's right. right. That's and right. And they, I'm sure they do, you know. Yeah. But that yeah. was just kind of one of those things, right? It's that's not right. How the company was made. Right. So when you go, uh, you meet a founder like that. That that's how the whole company you're, you're is structured. You're small. You're principled. You're independent. Yeah. You can make some decisions uh, she, about that. Yeah, yeah. And she grew the company to be the number one coffee, the whole time being true to that. Right. Right. So then here and she had is developed there. relationships. I know, you know, in, in Costa Rica and mm-hmm. other uh, mm-hmm. other coffee growing regions, and really had a had a, a, a deep personal connection. To, yeah, to the exactly. Growers. Exactly. Yeah. And so you know, and you know, woman owned business mm-hmm. as well. Uh, and even looking at the packaging, the packaging was more focused towards women. Kind right. of harkening, you know, think make me think back to Godiva, right? Like there's this the women are the ones purchasing the products yet. Yeah. That's that right. Individually talking to him. That's right. And um, so that was exciting for me. And uh, so we've been building it here. And it's been interesting because I've never really started anything from scratch. Like, yeah. okay, you know, you have the blank piece of paper. Now let's get started. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and uh, and that's been that's been really fun. Yeah. Do, are there are there unique challenges in you know because I think there are a lot of uh, brands from overseas anywhere Australia UK or somewhere in Europe or Asia. Who have ambitions of uh, coming, of launching in the U.S. because mm-hmm. it's a big consumer market, obviously, and and in some cases where uh, you know it's a U.S. company wanting to launch in another, again maybe in in an early stage Canada or Mexico or something like that. Mm-hmm. What what have you learned along the way about maybe some of the challenges? 
about like what what translates or doesn't translate between these kind of continental markets? Mm. Um, well, thankfully, Australia is not a lot different, right. than, you know, uh, than the United States. It's so more concentrated. It's smaller. Right? It is yeah. smaller, more right. concentrated. So the logistics of it. Uh, Jacqueline and I kind of joke around. I'm like, well. Yeah, the, the highways, you have the, you know, transportation yeah. is expensive because you have right. to go so far. That's right. Um, and, uh, you know, and some of the language, you know, again, we joke around. Yeah. Like, we'll go to a restaurant and she'll say, oh, well, the frites. I'm like, oh, she means French fries. That's you right. Know? That's right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. But That's other what, than one, that. One of my favorite is, uh, like, uh, of Australian people that I've known, uh, swimming costumes. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> costumes uh, or aluminum. Uh, uh, yeah. Some like, of those things. Really charming stuff. I love yeah, all of it. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, it's yeah. great, though. The ac- her yeah. accent's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, we joke around about that stuff. But, you know, people, uh, what what has been interesting, too, is that they were ahead, they're ahead in some ways of things the way right. they the way they view things culturally than the way we do right mm-hmm. so the, there's so many people here and there's so much waste and there's mm-hmm. you know you have such a division and um you know the haves and the haves nots right uh you know there's so many homeless people and right. um that's something that i don't think they have as much of in mm-hmm. australia and so they uh they're, they're very affluent and so translating that over to like okay there's more to give here in some ways. Um, so Jacqueline and I talk a lot about that too, is, yeah. okay, you know, with these coffee, like it's a sustainable coffee um, and fair trade. And we can, you know, she takes care of the folks back at the origin, right? right. You know, where the right. coffee is made and the farmers, mm-hmm. but then in the community, what can we do in the community? Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, she just was like struck by, gosh, there's, you know, there's so many homeless people. What, what can we be doing? And mm-hmm. women, obviously, a women-owned brand. We're very focused on women. So, right. what can we be doing to help uh, to help homeless women and children, and you know, help them, you know, get fed? You know, here we are drinking our coffee. There has to be something there that yeah. we can uh, that we can do that translates. And then, um, and then the environment in general. The Australia, you know, she's had uh, these biodegradable and compostable. Uh, coffee Nespresso pods for right. many years. Way way out ahead of the U.S. curve on that. They don't even. I mean, Nespresso is yeah. not even a thing. And then the pot, like the compostable thing, that just started showing up. And even if you go to the the grocery store shelf, you know, it's there's not very many. That's right. That's right. But yet it's this huge trend, and it's just assumed there. Yeah. Yeah, that's just how. Right. You know, and she was the first one that did that. Wow. Right. That's really so cool. she's very innovative in that way. Yeah. And so it's great that she. First, it's great that she's a thinker like that, and right. she knows um, she knows the people around the world to do it. And that's the other thing is we're so insulated with the United States. Mm. You know, like even if like if you and I were going to start a company, who do we know? Oh, I know somebody over down in uh, Florida that that's can help right. me out do that's this. Right. Or that. But it's just the United States. That's right. Whereas her view is the world. That's right. You know, and she's traveled so many places and picked mm-hmm. up so much that that really influences things. Mm-hmm. You know, she she might say, well, I, gosh, I had coffee. And, you know, in the Netherlands, and Mm -hmm. I discovered this way that they do things, I think that might translate over or an ingredient that, uh, you know, a flavor that doesn't even exist. We've never even heard of. That's right. In the United States. Laos at some point. Yeah. Yeah. that she. And so I think that that perspective Mm -hmm. and that network she has outside of the United States is really differentiating when it comes to, you know, innovation and and product development. Yeah, that's that's a really great insight. Again, Mm -hmm. yeah, we get very myopic, very, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, kind of America first with that stuff. And it's it's a big market. There's a lot of reasons for that. Mm -hmm. We tend to be monolingual, all Mm -hmm. all of that Mm -hmm. stuff. But um, it, it does put us at a disadvantage because, again, you can't, you don't have the same level of inspiration, uh, right? You don't. Yeah, in you don't. Sourcing and all the different things mm-hmm. that the world has to mm-hmm. offer. Yeah, and I think it's interesting too because uh, now we're at this uh, so much innovation in the food space of not just you know packaging and forms, but yeah. flavors, right? Yeah. And the different kind, you know, like I was just listening to something about uh, kimchi, right? Right. Who even ate that? That's right. You know, ten years, I didn't even yeah, know what that was. Koreans a ago. did. Yeah, yeah that's but, right. Yeah. So all these things are now becoming yeah. more common, and um, and I think that that's an exciting time for us, where we're actually looking outside of the United States to all these different flavors and and bringing them to the masses. Right. 
Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yes, yeah, so mm-hmm. you get you know you get Brazilian acai berries, or you get you yeah. get these things that are, are are fairly common in one place, but then mm-hmm. then you you begin to translate them across cultures, mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. people say, oh, this is a new thing, and I've I, I've never tried this before. Now right. they're experimenting with it in in new and novel ways, and and maybe new creations come from that. Right. Yeah. Like like kale chips, for example. Right, yeah. So I grew up eating kale chips. Okay. A long, long time ago, but when I came, you know, after I moved from Northern California, the kale, they didn't know what that was. That's right. right. And it became yeah. a thing. Why, why did you, so how, like, were, were they just available? Was it because California is so healthy or because you were in the, in the bread basket where there was a lot of kale being grown yeah, and so just people were just kale. drying it? Well, you, yeah, yeah, you just had kale. I mean, it was just it, in my it was garden. Just normal. Out, yeah, yeah. Just, you would go down, there was all these different lettuces. Right. There was kale and chard and, you know, all these different mm-hmm. things. And it was all fresh and there was it was all organic because it just was grown right there. And yeah. I didn't know any different. Uh-huh. And then when kale became a thing, I thought, oh, finally, I can find some kale. No, that's, that's <laughs> you know? really great. Yeah. I was like, oh, I had no idea that I had to pay yeah. 10 times more. I don't have more. to dry yeah. it myself now. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And right. just like, you know, when you would uh, make the dry them out and put mm-hmm. the seasoning on it, yeah, we did that before. Yeah. That's right. Now yeah. somebody else does it for exactly. you. How convenient. Exactly. So like if if you were like, you know, when let, let's imagine you're sitting down uh, and having coffee with with some, uh, maybe they're an early stage entrepreneur, uh, you know, m- maybe they're young, middle-aged, doesn't matter how old or how experienced. What are the things that, you know, as you start to like put the pieces together of your life and career are there are there clear nuggets of wisdom or or advice that you find yourself gravitating toward like if you're having that you know a good uh, a good ethical fair trade coffee a- across the, the <laughs> table from somebody um what are there things that you're like you i I wish I had known this when I was mm-hmm. getting started off, or mm-hmm. it, now that I think about you starting a new business, like I would really encourage you to spend your time over here. What are some mm-hmm. of those kind of key things that you think about? Um, the importance of the financials. Okay. Um, so that's definitely one thing. Uh, the way that I approached it, right, with Jacqueline, and she's the same way, both of us having experience, um, is we would sit down and think about like, okay, we want to bring this product to market it's going to start here right across Mm -hmm. the globe and it's going to travel all the way here you know and what do those margins look like at every stop you map out the supply chain Mm -hmm. and you look at the different all the hidden things everybody wants a cut Mm -hmm. and to talk to every single person about that to dig in really deep on all of that Mm -hmm. i feel like a lot of um entrepreneurs i've talked with get surprised by those things yeah and because maybe they just didn't have that experience to even ask the question Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. you know um because there's things that you just wouldn't necessarily know right um and building out those models so you know really early on before you've made commitments right how much something's going to cost so so the cost between a full truckload and less than truckload quantity or a full container versus yeah gas prices in the summer versus Mm -hmm. you know or um that ingredient cost um can it scale like do you even have enough of that right or how often do they grow this this rare Mm -hmm. exotic ingredient and how how much can you get and if Mm -hmm. you order it does it have to, you know, does somebody have to ride on a on a donkey down from the mountains right. with it and right. you can't get it for nine months? Right. Or, or like a simple thing like tomatoes. They're seasonal. That's right. Yeah. When are you going to get the tomato, you know? That's right. Uh, so things like that. And then also having a clear um, direction of where you want to go um, and mapping out. Like w- I spent a lot of time determining exactly which stores we would go to and when and how many of those stores. So, you know, if HEB has, what do they have, like six, 800 stores, something like that? Well, we're not going to be in all 800, right? Because right? they're not right. going to be the right fit. Right. So I'm not going to, you know, they may not know that. Like your demographic isn't in all those places. So it's not 800, it's really 200. Right. Yeah. Or it's, you know, I think there's 400 and something in in Texas and some in northern Mexico. But then even Mm -hmm. like all of those stores aren't the same and the shoppers are different in all of those stores. Exactly. Is this the right store for my product or my brand? Mm -hmm. And dialing in the pricing around it. So kind of along the lines of that, knowing the the entire supply chain. Mm -hmm. I know competitively that I need to be $9.99 on the shelf. Mm-hmm. Can I still feed my children at, at right. 9.99 yeah. when I really back yeah. it up? Because yeah. I'm not going to have the scale as someone right. else, you know. That's and, right. Um, those are 
big important things that I think if you didn't know. And and do you feel like there's an element where people um, kind of you know who who are less experienced and certainly they're passionate and they're they're eager to to try a thing. Mm-hmm. You know, I think sometimes there's a there, there's a blissful ignorance that mm-hmm. you don't know, mm-hmm. and they launch out and they try a thing, mm-hmm. and maybe their margins are kind of terrible, or there something's mm-hmm. messed up, mm-hmm. or they they didn't understand that the distributor wasn't going to be providing that service for free, or mm-hmm. what you know whatever mm-hmm. the thing mm-hmm. is, um, and then they have to come back and fix it later, mm-hmm. and you know that can be hard uh, to to have to have to go, oh no, I, I thought I had this right. you know, I thought I sold it for, for X and and you know and, and I bought it for, for Y, mm-hmm. but it turns out my my numbers were off. Right. And so that can be a scary moment. Yeah. And I mean what I think just going in, you just have to know that that's gonna happen. Yeah. Right. And just know so you can get we can get really tied up in the brand, like your baby. Right? And it's important. Yeah, and it's yeah. really important. And you just really have to know that it's going to change as you learn things and be open to learning and yeah. regrouping as a result because you're just going to get better and better if you do that. But if you get stuck in one way, like, oh, no, it's the brand I have to have, you know, like, the, I don't know, that color green mm-hmm. is the perfect color. But, yeah, you know, blue people don't like blue on food, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But I love blue, you know. Right. So those are things that you just have to be Unless open-minded. Unless it's Kraft Mac and Cheese. Exactly, yeah, blue box. Right. I mean, that's they right. kind of own that. <laughs> uh, but there's just certain aspects I think people need to be open to right. changing and, uh, and feedback and asking a ton mm-hmm. of questions. I mean, just in this whole experience uh, from the ground up that I've been working with uh, Jacqueline on uh, with Republica, it's been very new, right? I mean, I knew that there was logistics. Like, I knew the steps, but I didn't ever have to, like, dig into it like I did. Right. And so, I mean, you know, I called everybody. I'm, I just met you. Oh, what's your number? I'm going to call you about. Can you look at That's my spreadsheet right. to make That's sure right. that it's yeah. the right way? Yeah. And just really like building all those things out and asking for that, feedback. That learner all mentality. The time. Yeah. yeah. And and also tapping into the fullness of your network to yes. say, I, I don't know everything. Yeah. Right. yeah. So even somebody, and I think that's something you do really well because obviously, and as people are listening, uh, Lori has just tremendous uh, breadth and depth of experience. And even still, she's asking lots and lots of questions mm-hmm. of all kinds of folks because Mm -hmm. we don't know everything and every new project every new Mm -hmm. you're like well i haven't done this exact thing in this channel before Mm -hmm. what's your experience been like there Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right and i think there's something too that um i'm very aware of not being too comfortable with what i know too Um, because then you take things for granted and you miss opportunities yeah so someone who doesn't know something they wouldn't know any different they'll just figure out the best way to go about it, That's right? right? To meet That's their right. needs. Whereas I would go, oh, well, you need to do this stage and this stage That's and this right. stage. And then I could talk to them and think, think oh, you're right. Like, we, right. Were, why were we doing it that way? Do you have an example of something you that you've, you've learned along the way, kind of along those lines? Oh, gosh. I'm just thinking through, like, um, you know, some of the, you know, maybe the distribution stuff. Like, mm-hmm. oh, for example, okay, so um, buyer meetings. Okay. Right? So... You know, it's gonna be kind of high stakes. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm just thinking th- even back it up of, okay, we need to get distribution and we need to make money as fast as possible, mm-hmm. right? You want right. to be on the shelf. That's right. Well, I'm thinking through. Oh gosh. Okay. Well, they have buying calendars, and you know, gosh, how am I even gonna get it in my hand? Remember, I, I think even I right. probably asked you like, how am I gonna get it in my hands on that calendar? That's right. I didn't know that you didn't like. I always had the calendar. I didn't know yeah. that it wasn't like a public thing. That's right? right. Yeah, because you were always at these giant corporations that had full access to everything. Yeah, right? I, can, I could call anybody in the company and That's find right. anything. Right. That's right. Gosh, how am I gonna find that? And then you do find it. You're like, wait, I missed it. Oh no, I what know. am I gonna do? Yeah. And whereas. Um, so now it's like, oh, I can't give up. What am I going to do? So right. now talking to these entrepreneurs, oh, I went to the store and I talked to this guy and that mm-hmm, guy. And, mm-hmm. you know, there's a Whole Foods forager. There right. is? Oh. That's right. Let's uh-huh. check that out. And um, that you don't have to go to, you know, a thousand stores right out of the gate. That's right. right. You can go to just these small ones. proof of concept in a smaller it. format. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. And so just kind of circumventing the system, which is like what, how I started, right, going, you know, in Compton. But, um, you know, you forget that stuff. You know, you kind of just forget like, oh, there's a system and I'm just going to do it the way I know how to do it. And talking to these entrepreneurs, they're like, no, I just walked in and put it on the shelf. Isn't that what everybody does? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So, yeah, just not taking no for an answer, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And, and saying, all right, I, that door closed. I guess I got I need to find another door or window or mm-hmm. gap in the wall, something. I got to get through this this thing somehow. Yeah. Or, yeah, sampling. I didn't know how to pay somebody like a demo fee and have, inter- you know, do all that stuff. I right. just was out front 
giving people my product. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Again, the blissful ignorance. So, exactly. You know, and, and that's one of the things I think that here, you know, here on the Barcode Podcast, we're we're really passionate about equipping emerging consumer brands. And that's where I think your, your unique background where you've gone from, you know, uh, these 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 giant CPG brands and uh, and then you know some mid sized and small and that sort of thing and the fact that you're still in ha- you still have that students mentality even mm-hmm. though you are uh, you know you have the experience of a professor you're not uh, you're you're not just resting on your laurels mm-hmm. and saying ah oh, yeah I've I've been there done that I've mm-hmm. I've scaled this brand and that sort of thing and that's really uh, I- I- impressive and and also I think is a is a good indicator of why you've been successful in mm-hmm. a lot of different stations through mm-hmm. your career. So, um, well, uh, is there anything else like, uh, what are you, uh, is there anything that you're seeing right now in the in the market, either either trends or products or things like that, that, mm-hmm. that, you th- that, that you're finding particularly interesting or, or compelling? Right, and, you know, I think once you get infected with this mm-hmm. th- this this worldview, you you know, you're you're kind of a pain to go to the grocery store with and stuff like that because oh, you're yeah, always was... looking at things and taking yeah. pictures and all that sort of stuff. Like, what are you seeing out there that you think is pretty interesting? Well, you know, um, there's been a ton of trend around like tastes and flavors and innovation like that. But what I like to pay attention to is, and it's probably why I was drawn to coffee is. Commodity, commodities, right? The commodity yeah. categories, right? The things because, that have traditionally been unbranded. Right. And to me, those are huge opportunities. Sure. You know, if you can, there's not a lot you have to do to stand out sometimes. Right. But um, I've been doing a lot of research as I've been putting together our stuff for Republica. And I, I've seen that, um, you know, sustainability very much was about origin before, right? Like, where did that product come from? And and are you treating the farmers right? And is mm-hmm. it good for the environment? Right. And what I've been reading a lot of lately, just kind of just popping up as I've been researching other things, is it's it's evolving from product to now packaging mm-hmm. to people in terms of like your whole supply chain so that everything from beginning to end is sustainable. Kind of the and, cradle to grave concept. Yeah. yeah. And... Um, you know, I've seen some really neat innovation um, from other parts of the world. Yeah, um, come about, and it's who, in in many cases, are far ahead of the U.S. As we kind of discussed, far earlier. Yeah. ahead, and we just don't pay attention to that. I mean, right. I would have never said. I just kind of stumbled on it. Yeah, and because uh, I'm very curious, uh-huh. and uh, I think it's with the learner part. I just yeah. curious, and oh yeah. wow, who is that guy? What was he talking yeah. about at that thing? That let me let yeah. me click there, and then I get ten links in, and right, right. it's been three hours later. I'm like, oh. Oh, wow, I found that one nugget. That's right. Um, but I'm so excited about it. It's like a treasure hunt. But that, I think, is interesting in that if you want to innovate in any category, right, you could, you know, be in, I don't know, whatever, something boring. Uh, if you just go in with a package and a product that from beginning to end is sustainable, that's what consumers are looking for. Right. They're not going to sacrifice taste or convenience or And quality. the package had better still work. Yeah. So that's where so I, I think there have been some missteps where people attempted a sustainable package or something along mm-hmm. those lines that 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 you couldn't open the bag right. or you know whatever right. the thing is like it still has to work or if people are frustrated there it's not going to be exactly. sustainable exactly. for long. Exactly. It's yeah. never that I, that's not going to be your lead, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. The cost of entry is so it's got to be quality. It's got to mm-hmm. be taste. It's got to be, you know, whatever that consumer expects from that product. That's right. Those are still the table stakes. Right. And you, but if they can get all of that and not compromise their ethics, right, and their values, mm-hmm. then that's a huge win because – you're, you know, every time you're buying that thing, you know, is bad for the environment, but that's the one that you, it's the right one. I can't go without it. That's right? right. That's right. You have that little yeah. pang of guilt. Right. Yeah. And uh, just like if someone uses a K cup, it's like, oh, I'm not, but I'm not willing to give up two seconds for my cup of coffee. That's right? right. Now that's a habit. That's right. And, you know, that, that feels bad, but I just won't pay attention to that anymore. Yeah. Now you come along with something that tastes good, doesn't taste like mm-hmm. plastic, is biodegradable, is compostable. And oh, by the way, my neighborhood just, you know, uh, now has curbside compost. Now I'm feeling awesome. Yeah, I'll pay a dollar more for that. That's right. Because now I'm feeling even better. Right. Absolutely. 
Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, you, you still solve the problem or mm-hmm. you had the jobs to be done uh, related to the product, but now you're you're adding on top of that all this, this kind of halo effect of these positive, mm-hmm. you know, emotional uh, associations you have with like, exactly. yeah, see, I'm doing, doing the right thing by the planet and by people and, and this comprehensive exactly. view. Exactly. So, now you're starting to really separate yourself from, from the masses. Yeah, that's you know? really cool. Yeah, that's excellent. Well, Lori Acevedo, thank you for sharing your time and your perspective with us today. And again, fascinating career journey. And again, so much uh, wisdom that has clearly been uh, been gleaned through this this learner, this posture of, of being a learner at, at all phases and stages mm-hmm. that has, has clearly benefited you in all kinds of ways. And I know uh, is, is benefiting our, our listeners even today. So thanks again for sharing your time thank with you. us. This is really fun. Awesome. For links to the people and companies we mentioned during our conversation today, be sure to visit barcodestartup.com slash podcast for the show notes. And if you have a moment, please share, rate, and review the Barcode Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts so more like-minded listeners can discover these conversations. Thanks again for listening to the Barcode Podcast. We'll see you back here next week with a new conversation curated to equip emerging consumer brands.